What's even more interesting, even if you can get water, and this, I apologize, this is only a map of the U.S., but I think it's a pretty good thing. USA Today had this uh, graphic a few weeks ago. It's front page news. They did a study of, uh, I think it was 600 U.S. utilities. This is the price increase since 2004 of water. In some areas, you're seeing 600 percent. Toronto went up 600 percent since 1995 in their water price. They've got, I, I don't know if you've, you've been to Toronto, they got some water. They got a whole lake of it out there and their water prices are going up. Imagine what it's going to be like in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this is the trend that we're seeing. Now it's driven by a few things and I spent a lot of time in municipalities. I can tell you what they are. One, they got a, a, a pretty tough labor model um, that's going to take them years to unwind. Um, they've got some energy costs that are incredible. Um, but moreover, they have a population migration problem. And that becomes a real problem for you. And, and I'll tell you a story. I was working with um, a small dairy in, uh, in Michigan, in a place called Colon, Michigan, very small community. And one of the things that they had a problem was is that they would do a lot of washing and uh, that wash would go out into the lake, which was right by the dairy, and it would actually turn part of the lake white. And they said, man, that's pretty unsightly, and they were getting some heat over it. And so they said, let's go put in a, uh, a reuse system, and then we could filter that out, take the milk to condensate, they can go do some land application on that. It was a wonderful idea. Uh, the project had roughly a three and a half year payback on it, and everything was looking great until they found out they were the number one water consumer in coal in Michigan. The problem was is that they said, look, we've got a base cost, so even if you do this project and you reduce your water, I think it was by 30 or 40 percent, we're just going to have to adjust your rates 30 or 40 percent. You're going to pay the same difference. That's a small scale story on a big scale issue is that there, when you look at municipalities, they have a base cost challenge. And as they move into droughts, as they move into populations moving, all of a sudden they have a water surplus. In the US, we're actually running on a water, since 2008, we're running under a water surplus because if our production is down, these guys are pinched. And that's what's the number one factor is driving this up is they just can't unwind the cost. And if you're a water consumer, a major water consumer, all of a sudden, your ability to renegotiate water contracts, your ability to look at reuse, your ability to go do some other projects balances out against their lack of revenue, and that becomes a challenge. If you're in Atlanta, if you're in some of these other areas that are moving to a very water-stressed area, all of a sudden, you're looking at production reductions, and that becomes a real story. So when you look at water stress, it's a real story. You're seeing it in prices, and you're beginning to see it in equipment or in uh, production disruption. Now, here's the other thing, is we just conducted a, a pretty sizable customer um, and uh, consumer um, survey. And what we found is the idea around water has dramatically changed. Uh, 2000, or 1995, I was doing actually the uh, wastewater system here in, uh, in D.C. It's uh, Owasso, cleans the water here in D.C. And one of the things that they do is they get it to near drinking water. Actually, it's above drinking water quality. It's near sounds like it's below. It's near. It's actually above it. Um, and at the end of the tour, the idea was we put in this beautiful tile pool and the um, tour guy would reach in with his cup and take a big drink of the effluent water. And one, I thought, one, I thought that was cool. Two, I didn't sign up for it. But one, I thought that was cool. Um, but the idea was we couldn't get tour guys to do it. And then the idea was that the perception is that it's not clean. And the chuckling in the room begins to tell you that there's folks that don't exactly trust that. And after the stories I've told you about the municipal water, you, you got good reason. But the idea here is that those perceptions are beginning to change. And... I don't think that we're to the point of Singapore with their new water and some of these other folks that we work with globally that are, you know, pipe from the wastewater to your drinking water is one to one in Singapore. Um, but we are getting to a point where folks are beginning to say reapplication of gray water, that treating this water is a, is a good idea. And what's interesting 
is that it went beyond a good idea to the 80% of Americans believe it's important for utilities to do this. Now, what that means to you is, again, if you're an organic farmer and you're using irrigation and all of a sudden somebody shows up and says, hey, we're going to put, the industry calls it purple pipe, but it's reuse water. All of a sudden, what does that mean to your crops? Does that mean that they're being sprayed with possibly some pharmaceutical that couldn't be removed? Does that mean that you've got variants into that? And those are the type of issues that you're going to begin to face into. And you're going to begin to look at across your supply chain is, what do these look like? We talk a lot about reuse water. If you look at Florida, uh, the, the saying in the industry is that California talked about it, Florida did it. If you're from Florida, you know you've got um, a number of places that are working off reuse pipe. Uh, you're seeing Texas begin to look at this. All of that will begin at irrigation. All of that begins at the farms, because those are the big consumers of, of water. And that's going to be something that you're just going to have to continue to manage and look at as you go forward into this space. And also, there's going to be an expectation of how do you get more reuse water inside your facility. The uh, water use by region, and the way that I like to look at this chart is there's really three types of folks in the world. There are folks that are providing water and the quality doesn't much matter because we need the water so badly that even if it's a mud puddle, it's better than nothing. You see that in, in a number of spaces. Then there's the folks that I like to call the regulators that are beginning to realize that, hey, not just any water quality works, but we need to have better water quality because it becomes a growth engine and we need to get water quality consistent. China is one of them that's probably the easiest to say this because they had green rivers and they're well known for their lack of water policy. It began to affect GDP. It began to affect effectiveness. It began to affect initial quality. It began to affect whether or not the workers were going to be healthy enough to show up. Uh, and so they're beginning to change that. And then you have the folks that I call efficiency, which are the ones that say, wow, we buried a million miles of pipe in the ground in 1902. What the heck are we going to do now as it begins to fail? And the way to understand this is that you're going to begin to see a large percentage change, in some cases 50%, in some cases 300%. And this chart's really important to understand where do you position. So when you look at India, they have almost no clean water regulation at all. And they don't seem to be moving in that direction anytime soon. In fact, they're just now getting to where they're actually kind of trying to get something going on wastewater. Africa, depending on which country you're in, you're going to see both sides. of You're going to see from no policy to a policy of, if I own it, I have power, to a policy of our constitu your constitutional right to get a minimum amount of water. South Africa is that way. They have a constitutional right to so much water. And we work with a company today that builds meters that shuts them off after that right if they haven't paid. Um, and then you get to... Um, the Middle East Africa, who is well known for the world's most expensive water, and all of the things that are going on with desal uh, into that area, into the North America and Europe, where Europe is, is probably at the, the top of the efficiency model, and they have maintenance models that make a lot of sense. The ones that I would put at risk is North America. We have got a huge water infrastructure bill come and do. Huge. And it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of rediscussion about how we pay that, whether we move, to, we just continue to replace pipes, whether we rethink what that water looks like. And in Mexico, that's what they're doing today. They're actually areas of Mexico City um, and uh, Durango where they're going to a decentralized model, where they're going to treat the water less and then have water units at the homes. We see that um, in, uh, in India already today because it's completely unregulated um, there. And so that model changes how do you invest in your factories and how do you provide products uh, to your consumers into, into those spaces. And then I want to wrap with uh, just a couple of stories. The first one is Monitor. And this is um, a customer air products. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're a gas and chemical manufacturer. One of the things... Um, that they had was cooling tower issues, and you can read the slide. I'm not going to tell you that story. I'm going to tell you this story. Is they had 
disparate plants built across a number of eras, built by a number of acquisitions that had a number of different things, and they had a very difficult time at the enterprise level of controllership. You cannot drive a significant story, and this seems so obvious, but you can't drive a significant control mechanism unless you know what's going on and you can get those things where you're getting to the same readings and the same CTQs. And that's what Air Products did, is that they basically went in, digitized their water systems, and saw dramatic savings in their uh, consumption rates, but also their water rates. The value they got out of this is they were able to go to a closed loop system. We'll talk about that uh, in a second. Nissan, this is uh, the plant in Smyrna, Tennessee. They build the Sentra um, there, and now the Leaf, and I forget the other, the other car. Uh, what they did is they came to us on the other side of this, is that they had a production problem. And we're going to have to build a brand new uh, plant. I think they were looking at a place in Franklin, Tennessee at the time. And the reason was they were water limited. And what they did is after we began to look at it, we said, no, you've got tons of water. And they, they were looking at the edge of their discharge permit. They could go ask for some more discharge. Um, but that got into some issues on where they were discharging into. And so the only way they were going to be able to grow was to get smarter on that. We did two things with them. One is did a water balance study. It's a very simple thing. Just go figure out where the water is being used. And when they took it a step further and said they're going to put in revenue grade meters, which were pretty inexpensive. You're talking a couple three hundred dollars throughout the plants. And they charged each one of the distribution or each one of the production areas with the water bill each month. You'd be amazed how much the paint shop dropped their water bill and how much they began to turn things off when it showed up on that manager's report that he has to pay for his water bill. It was such a success. Um, they submetered the electrical side of that plant too, and now do both of them. They charge all of their um, line managers for their utilities and saw a tremendous thing. It's tremendous enough that they're actually able to add a new plant line there, save the building the new factory, and um, got a better water footprint out of that that we did a treatment process on and are doing some reuse uh, for them. So they're even now below that. They could add probably two more lines. So you went from 2005 production, where they're against that look at a new factory, to today added a line and probably could add one or two more lines to that facility, and the cost profile of that plant dropped dramatically. That's, that's the power of, of that and the power of pulling that together. Now, I, I mentioned a little bit about closed loop systems. Here's the whole thing, is in an in a, in a open loop system, like I said before, you're going to be paying for chemicals. You're going to be paying to heat the water. You're going to be paying all of these costs. Most folks let that go to drain. And Kellogg's was one of those examples. They had a 30-year-old uh, lime softener, which doesn't matter what a lime softener does, but it's basically around water quality. And it was what was coming back from um, their cooling towers, and the water was going to their cooling towers. What they did is they took that out, put a reverse osmosis system, and I want to get into the technology there, but the idea is that they began to rethink about water and went to a closed loop system, which basically circulates the water, I think it's uh, eight times in their case, before the water then has to have some makeup water put in, cut down their water costs, cost, but the big savings were energy, because they're not reheating the water, the water's staying warmer, so the boilers aren't working as hard to heat that, they, uh, they use this for cooking. Um, uh, and uh, system heat, and maybe it's just those two, just heating the facilities and then for cooking. Um, and then the other part is they're saving chemicals. Huge opportunity there to kind of optimize that. So here's the big story. 22% of the world's GDP water stressed areas today. 2050, half the world roughly, 45% of the world's GDP in water stressed areas. Huge opportunity there, whether you're figuring out how can I do a product for a hydration product, how can I get into those spaces, how can we get something that makes sense there, um, but also gives you some opportunities. One, which is to monitor the quality of the water and the usage, operationalize that with your staff, optimize where you're using that, and ultimately prepare your supply chain for, uh, for the changes there. So with that, that's my, uh, my story. I think we've got a... a 
We're going to a uh, panel discussion.